Hello everyone, this is Joan from CanHub and in this tutorial we will be discussing how names of muscles are derived. Studying anatomy can be quite challenging from remembering the names of muscles to knowing their insertion, origin, innervation and function. It is sometimes difficult just to remember the name of a muscle, let alone all the other structures that are associated with it. And in this tutorial we will discuss how muscles get their names in order to help make it easier for you to identify muscles and remember their names. There are a few basic conventions when it comes to the naming of a muscle. Once you understand these basic conventions, it becomes much easier to identify a muscle. So in the following slides, we will look at some of the basic methods used to name or derive the name of a muscle, which usually take into account one or more characteristics of the muscle ranging from the size of the muscle to the function of the muscle and so on and so forth. The name of a muscle can be derived from its shape. For example, the term deltoid, which basically means triangular in shape or shaped like the Greek letter delta, can be used to name a muscle. A prime example of this is the deltoid muscle. Also, the term trapezius is used, which basically describes a trapezoid or diamond shape of a muscle. A good example of this is the trapezius muscle, which, as you can see, has a trapezoid shape. The flatness of a muscle can also be used to derive its name, as is in the case of the platysma, which gets its name from the French word plat, meaning flat. The Latin term serrare, meaning saw, is also used when described the shape of a muscle. For example, the serratus anterior muscle derives its name from this term due to the fact that its attachment onto the ribs sort of forms a serrated edge like a saw. In many cases, muscles derive their names from the size of the muscle. Such terms used to denote the size of a muscle include vastus, which comes from the Latin great, for example, the vastus lateralis muscle. The term major is used to describe how large a muscle is, usually used in comparison to another muscle, for example, we have the pectoralis major muscle. In contrast, the term minor, as you may have guessed, is used to describe a muscle that is the smaller of two similar muscles, as is the case of the pectoralis minor muscle. The term maximus comes from the Latin meaning largest or greatest. The gluteus maximus muscle is a prime example of the use of this term. The term minimus is the Latin for least or smallest and is also used in naming muscles such as the gluteus minimus muscle, which is the smallest of the three gluteal muscles. Or in the case of muscles of the hand, the flexor digiti minimi muscle, which flexes the little finger. The length of the muscle can also be taken into account when naming it, using the terms longus for a long muscle and brevis for a short muscle. For example, the longus capitis muscle, which is a long muscle of the head and neck, or the abductor pollicis brevis muscle, which is a short muscle of the thumb. The muscles can also derive their names from the orientation of their muscle fibers. The terms used to describe the orientation of muscle fibers include transverse, oblique, and rectus. The term transverse, as in the transverse muscle of the tongue, is used to describe muscle fibers that run perpendicular to the midline. The term oblique is used to describe muscle fibers that run diagonally at an angle or slanting. A good example of this would be the oblique muscles of the abdomen. Here we see the external oblique muscle, whose fibers, as you can see, run obliquely. Finally, the term rectus describes muscle fibers that run parallel to the midline, such as in the case of the rectus abdominis muscle, which you see here. 
The word rectus in Latin means straight and can also be used to describe a muscle that runs straight. For example, four of the six muscles of the eye that control the eye movement, namely the superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, and medial rectus muscles. The fourth method that is used in deriving the name of a muscle is by naming it according to the action that the muscle facilitates. As such, muscles can be described as flexors, extensors, supinators, pronators, levators, depressors, rotators, adductors, abductors, sphincters, and tensor muscles. So first, let's look at the top five actions of our list, starting with flexors. The so-called flexor muscles carry out flexion, and a good example of these muscles are the flexor muscles of the forearm. For example, the flexor carpi radialis, which is one of the superficial flexors of the forearm, and is responsible for flexing the hand at the wrist joint or radial abduction. The term flexion describes the action of bending a limb. Next is extension, which describes the opposite action of flexion. The extensor muscles are muscles that return the limb to its original position or straighten the limb. For example, the extensor indices muscle straightens the index finger. We then have supination, which describes the action of turning the limb so that the palm of the hand or sole of the foot faces upward or outward. For example, when the supinator muscle of the forearm contracts, it rotates the forearm and hand so that the palm faces upwards. On the other side of the spectrum, we have pronation, which describes the rotation of the limb so that the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot face downward and inward. For example, the aptly named pronator teres muscle carries out this very action. The term levator is used to describe muscles that perform a lifting action. For example, the levator anguli oris muscle lifts or elevates the angle of the mouth when we smile. In continuing with the naming of the muscles according to their action, the next group of muscles we look at are the depressors. As you may well have guessed, the term depressor is used to describe a muscle that carries out the opposite action of levator muscles, which is depression or pulling downward. For example, when we make a sad face, the depressor anguli oris muscles are responsible for pulling the angles of the mouth downward. We are moving on to the rotators, as the name suggests are muscles that facilitate the rotation of a limp or circular motion about a joint. For example, the muscles of the rotator cuff, which although individually these muscles do not have the word rotator in their names, they are called the rotator cuff muscles simply because this is the action that they collectively carry out. We have the abductor muscles that facilitate abduction, which is the movement of the limb or appendage away from the midline. The abductor pollicis brevis muscle, for example, abducts the thumb or facilitates the movement of the thumb away from the midline. Adductor muscles, on the other hand, facilitate movement towards the midline, as is the case with the adductor pollicis muscle, which adducts the thumb, as you can see in this image. The term sphincter is used for muscles that close an opening, for example, the pyloric sphincter muscle. Finally, we have tensors, which describe muscles that tighten or make something rigid, like the tensor fascia lata muscle, which sustains tension of the iliotibial tract. Now, some muscles derive their names from the number of points of attachment at their site of origin. A good example of this are the biceps brachii muscle, which has two points of origin. We also have the triceps brachii, which has three points of origin, and the quadriceps femoris muscle, which has four points of origin. I'm sure you can see a pattern forming here, right? 
Now the term bicep comes from the Latin meaning two-headed, the bi meaning two, and the seps, which comes from the word caput meaning head. Following the same logic, the three-headed muscle is aptly given the prefix tri, and the four-headed muscle quadri. As we have just seen, some muscles derive their names from the number of points of origin of the muscle. In addition, muscles can also be named according to their point of origin and insertion. One such example is the sternohyoid muscle, which is a muscle of the neck region that has its origins on the dorsal surface of the manubrium of the sternum and the sternoclavicular joint, and inserts on the body of the hyoid bone. So we have already seen that some muscles are named according to the mechanical actions they facilitate. Additionally, some muscles have been named according to their function. For example, the risorius muscle, which is a muscle of facial expression, and it derives its name from the Latin word risus, which means laugh. This muscle is sometimes simply referred to as the laughing muscle. Finally, some muscles are named according to their location in the body. For example, the tibialis anterior muscle is located in front of the tibia. Some muscles also derive their names after their position or location in reference to a similar muscle. In this case, the following terms are used. Infra or inferior, meaning below or more caudally situated. We also have supra or superior, meaning above or more cranially located. Medialis, medial, middle or medius, meaning in the middle or closer to the midline. Intermedius, meaning intermediate. And lateralis or lateral, meaning to the side or away from the midline. An example of a muscle named using one of these basic terminologies would be the supraspinatus muscle, which is the more superiorly situated of the two spinatus muscles of the scapula. But don't let your learning stop there. Visit kenhub.com where you can read interesting articles, test your knowledge with challenging quizzes, explore our atlas with beautiful anatomical images, or watch more video tutorials like this one. Yes, you'll find everything you need to master anatomy in no time. Go on, click the button. You know you want to.